Now you can hear me. Let's see what announcements we have this morning. Um, Project 2020 is today. You have any old uh, sunglasses, regular glasses, uh, you can drop them in the box in the hallway, and then they will get them picked up or um, bring them in tonight when we have uh, youth services. Um, kids, our uh, services tonight start at 5. Uh, Sunday night study will start at 6 tonight. There will be a new women's Bible study beginning tomorrow night at 6. The Ladies of Grace will be doing a study called Daughters, Where Is Your Crown? A book looking at the biblical virtue in the life of Ruth and Proverbs 31. There also will be a Valentine's dinner on February the 10th at 6, at 6 here at the church. Uh, $25 per individual or $50 for a couple. You will need to see uh, Kayla Morrow and let make your reservations with her. There will be a uh, glamp camp hosted by First Baptist Church of La Center, February the 24th at 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. All ladies are invited to attend middle school and up. Register by February the 11th. Cost is thirty dollars. You can talk to Kayla Morrow again for that information. D Now Weekend, March the first and second at Spring Bio Baptist Church for middle school, high school, and young adult ages eighteen to twenty-three. If you want to learn more, you can contact Kayla Morrow. She's a busy little girl. My. February the 14th will be Ash Wednesday here at the church. We will have a service at 6 p.m. If you need anything to go into bulletin, prayer request, or anything, you need to contact Brother Tyler, and he can get that in for you. Do we have any announcements from the floor? All reservations for the Valentine Banquet for Wednesday, so you can contact Kayla. Any other? If not, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we come to you this morning. and Father, we give you thanks that uh, we can come out and study your word, Father. I ask you to be with us as we go through our song service, Father. Just anoint our musicians from on high, Father. Pour into them as they sing out to us, Father. Father, I ask that you be with us. Uh, the prayer request, Father, you know each and every one, whether we mention them or not, Father. You know who needs healing, who needs comforting, Father. And we just ask that you wrap your loving arms around them. Now, Father, I ask you to be with Brother Tyler, Father, as he brings the message, Father. Pour into him as he pour out to us, Father. And we ask it all in your precious name. Amen. Let's greet our neighbor.
Well, good morning, church. So glad to be with you all and see your lovely faces. I'm glad that's warmed up. How about you? <laughs> but as we gather this morning, I just invite you, I know that some of you just sat down, I invite you to stand as we sing to our God and King this morning.
make us faithful so that whatever gift we bring may be an offer of worship before you. In Jesus' name, amen.
nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Sorry, we got our people mixed up. <laughs> Sorry, Miss Karen. Psalm 51, 10 to 17. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence, and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and make me willing to obey you. Then I will teach your ways to rebels, and they will return to you. Forgive me for shedding blood, O God who saves. Then I will joyfully sing of your forgiveness. Unseal my lips, O Lord, that my mouth may praise you. You do not desire a sacrifice, or I would offer one. You do not want a burnt offering. The sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart, O oh God. The word of God for the people of God. Okay, let's have our kids come down for kids' time. Sorry, I uh, didn't realize we were doing this. So um, we're going to throw something out here. So do you guys know <clears throat> a guy named Jesus? How many raise your hand if you know a guy named Jesus? You know about a guy. Do you know what he said when people asked him how to get to heaven? You know what he said? Jesus said, I am the, everybody do it with me. Everybody, Jesus said, I am the way. Oh, wait, hold on. Oh, oh wait, hold on. Everybody do this. I am the way. <laughs> okay, I am the way. So, <laughs> so Jesus made a way because you know how he made a way, guys? Do you know how Jesus made a way for us to get to, to heaven and get to the Father? Do you know how he did that? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so if you tr believe in him and you trust him, you love him, yeah, that's how you can, that's how, yeah, yeah, so that's how we are able to get to heaven. But what did Jesus do? How did he show that he loved us? What did Jesus do, guys? Oh, Colin, yes, sir. He died on the cross. Why did he have to die on the cross? Why did he die on the cross? Someone other than Sophia or Colin. 
for our sins, right? And what is what are sins? Sins are what? Have you ever? How many of you have ever uh, not listened at school, or maybe disobeyed your parents? How many of you have ever? Told, have you ever told a lie? How many of you may have taken something that didn't belong to you? Oh, so guess what? We've all sinned. We all break God's law. But Jesus says even while we were still sinners, he came to die for us. Because you know what? There has to be consequences for our sins, right? So if we disobey at school, there's consequences, right? There's things that happen because we, we lose out, right? We get a dojo down. Yeah, you get dojos down. Yeah, right? Yeah. So, but the thing is, Jesus came to take our punishment, the consequence. And so he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one can come to the Father except through me. So if we trust him, we love him, we follow him, then that's how we can get to heaven and we can be with him forever, okay? So we're gonna pray real quick, and then we're gonna go upstairs for Kids Church. So Father, I thank you that you are the way, that you came and you gave your life for us, that we, um, even though we have fallen short, even though that we have sinned, you took our consequences and that you made a way, you showed us your love for us, and if we trust you, that we can be with you again one day. So I pray that these little ones would know that and see you for who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, have fun, guys. I apologize that you have to hear from me so much. It's like I wasn't here at all last week, and now you're having to hear from me, like from singing, kids' time. I'm I'm sorry, <laughs> but uh, so glad to be back with you all. Um, I truly miss being with you all. I'm so glad to be back. I honestly, people have asked me how it was, and I'm like, it was good, but honestly, I feel like I needed a vacation for my vacation. So <laughs> I'm glad to be back. Glad to be home. There's no place like home, and so. I missed you all. We got to join online, so I'm thankful that we have online. So if you're joining us online, thank you for joining us. Uh, we are glad that you're joining with us through uh, YouTube and our live stream. So this morning, I want us, I want everybody to imagine, if you will, a setting like something out of Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark, okay? There's this really famous scene where they're in the market, and all of a sudden, he gets caught where there's a sword-wielding, like, enemy of his, right? And he gets really fed up. He pulls out his pistol and just ends it right then and there. But there's a lot of commotion. It's really busy. There's this, you know, buying, selling, trading, all that stuff. So imagine that you're back in a time like that in Egypt um, in the 1930s, right? And someone offered to sell you clay jars containing really old manuscripts that hadn't been seen in 1,500 years, okay? So this antiquity dealer is trying to get you to buy this. What would you do? Well, unlike Indiana Jones, even though I enjoy those films very much, that actually happened. In the 1930s, there was in this marketplace a dealer who sold illegally these jars that had been buried in a cemetery for over 1,500 years. And these jars eventually ended up in the hands of a man named Chester Beatty. Now, Chester Beatty was an antiquities dealer, and he announced to the public that there had been documents that were found, and these ancient documents contained parts of the book of Ezekiel, Daniel, Esther, Jeremiah, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, Hebrews, and Revelation. So there's a lot of New Testament books and some Old Testament books that were a part of these. Now this find was so important because it helped give us clarity and give Bible scholars access to some of the oldest copies of the New Testament writings. So these writings for, are within about 100 years of the life of Christ and of the apostles. And they were buried in a cemetery for over 1,500 years. And someone, probably a grave robber, dug them up and tried to pawn them off. And they landed in the hands of this dealer. And he said, hey, guys, we have found this amazing find. And that was one of the most amazing finds because... For 500 plus, well, actually, yeah, for over 500 years, 
we didn't have very many ancient manuscripts of the Old or the New Testament. And so in the 1930s and 1940s, there were huge discoveries with the Dead Sea Scrolls and the BD uh, papyrus. And so while we don't have to, the amazing thing is, while we don't have to know the Greek and the Aramaic, because we can't, I mean, I can't even really read this. I, I took Greek, and I, this is, because it's handwritten, I can't read that, right? But the beautiful thing is, we don't have to know Greek or Aramaic or Hebrew to understand the words that we read in Scripture today. We don't have to risk our lives getting a copy of a smuggled Bible in our own language. We don't have to explore caves or go to graveyards to try to uncover the truth of who Christ is. So when we have the Word of God, whether it's in print or on our phone, it is a miracle in and of itself. And I know it can be really intimidating to approach the 66 books, the 1,189 chapters, the 31,102 verses, or over 700,000 words in this Bible. Yet they are God's words to his people. And it's a miracle because people have literally given their life so that we could have a copy of this Bible in our own language. And we as Americans who speak English are the most spoiled because we have so many different translations and so many different versions. And we can get stuff with flower prints and we can have a plain Jane Bible. We can have the note-taking Bible. There's so many different versions. Whatever you want, you can find. And there are people literally giving life and limb to get a copy in their own language for it to be smuggled today. And I think we take this lightly. But when we approach this, there's some really important things to remember. First, we have to pray. Paul tells young Pastor Timothy to study to show himself approved to God. We are responsible for our own faith journey. And in that journey, Jesus promised that the Holy Spirit would lead us to all truth. So we must pray and seek the leadership of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will not go against the Bible, and the Bible will not go against the leading of the Holy Spirit. Secondly, we need to seek to understand what the writers and the Holy Spirit were trying to tell the original audience. So who, the people that were reading these letters in the Greek and the Aramaic and Hebrew, the, those that were listening to it in church as they gathered, what was the author and the Holy Spirit trying to say? In other words, what is the author's intended message or the aim for short, of the scripture. What is the author's intended message? Lastly, because it is written in the Bible does not mean that you should do it. Scripture is full of people of God that do terrible things. They commit violent acts. They, they sin. They disobey God. That doesn't mean that you should do it. But it is describing. Just like if you're online and you're looking at a description of something, you're just trying to get information, right? Well, the scripture contains a lot of information for us to know, to be informed. But it doesn't mean that it's prescribing or telling us to do something. But there are many passages that, passages that tell us what to do or prescribing for us what we should do. The reason why I wanted to take a moment to highlight these realities and, and to understand how we approach scripture is because when we're studying the word of God, like we are in the, the book of Galatians, we need to understand what is it that Paul is trying to tell his audience. How are we responsible for hearing these things and these truths, and how are we responsible for applying them to our lives? And what is it telling us to do? Is it just describing something, or is it prescribing, or is it doing both? So as we continue in our study this morning, let's keep these in mind, and let's go to the Lord in prayer. So Father God, as we come to you this morning, I ask that you would get me out of the way. It be your truth, that you would be lifted high. Jesus, that as we come and we approach your words, that we would hear and our hearts would be open, our minds would be open to you. That we would decrease, that we would get out of our own way and, and we would lay aside all the sins, all the anxiety, all the stuff that gets in our way of following you. That we would lay those things down momentarily just to hear and to be with you. So we ask that you would go before the reading of your word, that you would go before the preaching that hearts and minds will be open to you, Holy Spirit. Help us to be aware of your presence here this morning with us here and now. And may you have freedom to move as you will. In Jesus' name, amen. So when we approach the book of Galatians, we talked two weeks ago about Galatians and how it was written around 48 AD, making it one of the oldest books in the New Testament, if not the oldest book. And the reason why we're starting with the letters to the church and starting with Galatians because 
Even the gospel accounts were written later on. They were penned later on. So this book really can help give us insight into what was happening 13 to 15 years after the ascension of Jesus. So the big picture of this letter is trusting, either trusting and keeping the law or trusting in Christ for our salvation. So it's the faith versus the law. There are a group of Jews who were saying to the Gentiles or people that were not Jews that in order to be right with God, they had to get circumcised. They were adding a requirement to the gospel, Jesus plus a physical act to make them right. Paul addressed this in chapter 2, but for clarity, what we're talking about here, this is a different gospel, and that's what Paul says. And he said, let them be cut off or let them be cursed. This is a different gospel. And anyone delivering a dis- different gospel, this is what the definition is here. He's using very strong language. He said, they are without hope of being redeemed, a person or thing doomed to destruction. So what he's saying here is if you preach a different gospel or believe a different gospel, you don't have any hope because the only hope is Christ and his reality, his gospel, his truth. So don't add to or take away from it. So what we talked about two weeks ago, we summed it up that we live in hostile territory. There are those that want to take and manipulate and twist the gospel for their own benefits. And Satan is a hungry lion seeking whom he can devour. He's the father of all lies, the deceiver of all deceivers, and that's what he wants to do. Because we live in his domain, and he wants to take the truth and twist it, because he wants to take as many people to hell with him as he can. Because that is his eternal reality. Truth is not relative. You can't say, well, that's my truth, and this is your truth. Truth doesn't have, it's black and white. Truth is not relative. It has to be fact for it to be truth. And we read that Jesus and his resurrection is truth, and it's not relative, and it's a person. Truth is a person. Worldly approval, Paul even said, is garbage or refuse or dung. He's saying it's like excrement. It's like that's what worldly approval is like. He said it's like garbage. And finally, we must seek God and his approval above all else. We are made right or approved solely by faith in Christ and trusting in what he has done. So this morning, if you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Galatians chapter 1. We're going to be picking up in verse 11. Galatians chapter 1 and verse 11. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Uh, If you have your Bible, you can put that in there. Or if you don't have a physical copy, please let me know. I'd love to get you a copy of the Bible. But um, we are in Galatians chapter 1, verse 11. So it says this, dear brothers and sisters, I want you to understand that the the gospel message I preach is not based on human reasoning. I received my message from no human source and no one taught me. Instead, I received it by direct revelation from Jesus Christ. You know what what I was like when I followed the Jewish religion, how violently I persecuted God's church. I did my best to destroy it. I was far ahead of my fellow Jews in zeal for the traditions of my ancestors. But even before I was born, God chose me and called me by his marvelous grace. Then it pleased him to reveal his son to me that I would proclaim the good news about Jesus to the Gentiles. When this happened, I did not rush out to consult with human beings, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to consult with those who were apostles before I was. Instead, I went away to Arabia, and later I returned to the city of Damascus. Three years later, I went to Jerusalem to get to know Peter. I stayed with him for 15 days. The only other apostle I met at that time was James, the Lord's brother. I declare before God that I am writing to you what this is not a lie. After I, after that visit, I went north into the provinces of Syria and Sicilia, and there the churches in Christ that are in Judea didn't know me personally. All they knew of what was what people were saying. The one who used to persecute us is now preaching the very faith he tried to destroy. And they praise God because of him, or because of me. That, there's a lot to unpack there, but we're, we see that Paul is trying to say, hey, this message that I have was not concocted by man or by human reasoning. The Jews, he talked about, like we talked about a couple weeks ago, the Judaizers, those that were telling that they had to get circumcised, They were using human logic and reasoning to twist the words of truth. They sought to prove that they were right with God by being faithful to the Old Testament laws. 
Moses and Abraham were the prophets that they looked to. You know, the thing is, young Jewish boys were raised in temple. And in temple, what they would do is they would spend the first 13 years of their life memorizing and studying the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And those books contain history, law, and how God related to his people. And so if they were really proficient, if they were really, really good with the Torah, and they understood, they would go on to be rabbis, potentially, or teachers of the Torah. Now, if they didn't, they would go out and be, have just a normal, everyday job, like the apostles. They were fishermen. They were tax collectors, right? Some were doctors. They had jobs. But they still had that foundational education for the first 13 years of their life in the Torah. They literally would sing it and read it and memorize it so where they could speak it aloud and quote it verse by verse. And they thought because they knew the Torah, they knew God's laws, that by obeying the law that they were right with God. So the Jews coming into the church, they're saying, hey, we are the chosen people of God. God made a promise with Abraham, our ancestor. And he gave Moses, our ancestor, the law. And we have to keep that to be right with him. And so they thought that this gospel was totally contradicting the truth that they understood. So this guy, Paul, he was trying to say, hey, if anybody's a good Jew, I'm the best of the best. He's like, I, he said, I persecuted the church. I was, I was perfect. I had so much passion for the traditions and the laws of my ancestors. You know what's amazing? Let's read about his before Christ days, or his BC days. In the history book that is Acts, we see this in Acts 7. Acts 7.57 says this, they put their hands in their ears and began shouting and they rushed at him. Okay, so to set this up a little bit, there was a, so the early church, after Judas killed himself, they had, there was a 12, right? So now it went down to 11. So they chose Matthias to replace him. Now the apostles were busy teaching and preaching, but the church was growing so quickly that they couldn't do everything that they were, that they were being asked to do. Literally, on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 people were added to the church. So if you literally go from like 200 to 3,000 overnight, that's pretty crazy, right? And so these 12 guys are like, we can't do it all. We're trying to teach and disciple and try to meet with people and pray with them. So they said, we're going to appoint deacons or servants to help us oversee how we manage the money and making sure people are visited and taken care of. And so they appoint seven deacons. And one of those men, his name was Stephen. And he was so passionate about the truth of Christ that he was preaching and teaching. And finally, word came to the Jewish leaders, and they put him on trial. And after Stephen got done preaching, it said they put their fingers in their ears. These are the religious leaders, the Jewish leaders. They put their fingers in their ears, and they rushed at him and dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Now, what's interesting is this was illegal because you know who was in charge? The Romans. The Romans were in charge. Now, they, the Jews could put their people on trial, but ultimately commit capital punishment had to go through their proper channels. But they were so angry at Stephen that they dragged him out and stoned him illegally. So they killed him illegally. His accusers took off their coats and laid them at the feet of a young man named Saul. What's interesting is Paul was Saul. So this young man is standing there holding the coats of the people that are killing this guy who loves Jesus and sharing the gospel with them. As they stoned him, Stephen prayed, Lord, receive my spirit. He fell on his knees shouting, Lord, do not charge them with his sin. And then he died. Saul was one of the witnesses and he completely agreed with the killing of Stephen. So Saul is there and he's like, yes, you got one. You got another one down. We're doing good. We're getting, we're, we're going against the church. We're killing them. I'm so glad we're doing that. And then a great wave of persecution began that day, sweeping over the church in Jerusalem. And all the believers, except the apostles, were scattered through the region of Judea and Samaria. Some devout men came and buried Stephen with great mourning. But Saul was going everywhere to destroy the church. 
He went from house to house, dragging both men and women to throw them into prison. So you see how violently he was against the church. He literally was foaming at the mouth. Okay, this, the way he had so much hate, the writer here, Luke, when he's writing about Paul or Saul and his anger towards the church, he equates it to a ravenous animal. So imagine like a hungry wolf, right? Wanting to devour its prey, foaming at the mouth. That's how he felt about the church. He hated them so much. And he had authority from the Jewish leaders to go and arrest people, to put them in jail. And un unfortunately, they were dragged out from their own homes, put on trial for blasphemy, and they ultimately would die because blasphemy was taken care of by capital punishment. So they were stoned to death. And yet, something happens. We read about a, the king of the Jews, Herod Agrippa. Okay, He's kind of like, I don't know, Okay, like in the UK, you have like the royal family and then you have like the parliament and the prime minister. Who has the real power? It's the parliament and the prime minister. The royal family doesn't really have that power anymore, right? So the thing is, Herod Agrippa was kind of like the royal family. He, he was just kind of there. He was kind of a puppet government, but really the people that had the power were, were the Romans. And so Paul is going to stand, because the thing is, if, if Herod found someone to be guilty, they'd be sent to the Romans, the Romans would say, what do you want to do? Want to kill him? Okay, go ahead and kill him. And basically the Romans would give them approval, but they have the authority. So Paul is standing before King Agrippa, this puppet leader. And he's being on trial because, again, he's preaching the gospel and he's being accused of blasphemy, so he's standing before the Jewish leader. And this is what we read. So in Acts 26, verses 9 through 20, it says this. I used to believe that I ought to do everything I could to oppose the very name of Jesus of Nazareth, the Nazarene. So this is Paul talking. Indeed, I did just that in Jerusalem. Authorized by the leading priest, I, caught, I cast, or caused many believers there to be sent to prison. And I cast my vote against them that were condemn, condemned to death. So literally, he was guilty of having a vote of putting people to death. Many times I had them punished in synagogues to get them to curse Jesus. I was so violently, I, I was so violently opposed to them that I even chased them down in foreign cities, places where he didn't have authority. He would even go break the law just to get Christians so he could arrest them and ultimately where they could be killed. One day, I was on such a mission to appoint you as my servant and witness. Tell people that you've seen me and tell them that I will show you in the what I will show you in the future. And I will rescue you from both your own people and the Gentiles. Yes, I'm sending you to the Gentiles to open their eyes so they may turn from the darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God. Then they will receive forgiveness for their sins and be given a place among God's people who are set apart by faith in me. And so, King Agrippa, I obeyed that vision. I preached first to those in Damascus and Jerusalem throughout all Judea and all the Gentiles that all must repent of their sins and turn to God and prove that they have changed by the good things they do. So Paul's claims to be the best of, of the best among the Jews were legitimate. And you have to understand, in Judaism, to threaten the laws and the custom of the Jewish faith was to question God himself. But Paul shares all of this in his letter to the Galatians to prove that God did a work in his heart and that the good news about Jesus is real. Like we discussed two weeks ago, Jesus didn't come to throw out the laws of Moses, the 613 laws, but he came to fulfill them because no human person could check off every single box for every 613 of those laws. That's part of the reason why the good news is so good, because we're free. We don't have to obey the law anymore. And we're free from the bondage and the slavery of sin in our lives. Paul went from looking for the approval of the Jewish leaders to seeking approval only from God. And that is why he said that worldly approval is like garbage. Paul faithfully carried out the mission of God and called that God entrusted to him. 
And along the way, he met Peter, who was an apostle, and he was the one that was sent to preach the gospel to the Jews. And James, the very brother of Jesus, who was the leader of the church in Jerusalem, who was ultimately killed for his faith, they didn't disagree or stop Paul from preaching. And just like the other churches who had heard about Paul, they began praising him for the ministry of faith that he had. So what can we learn from this? What can we learn about all of this? First of all, human effort, achievements, faithfulness, merits, or works can't make us right with God. Just like, I mean, I said that last time, and I'm going to say it again. There is nothing. Scripture multiple times talks about how human efforts and our own goodness cannot make us right with God. And that's what Paul tried to do before he became a Christian, before Christ got to him. And that's what the Jews were trying to do when they came into the church, telling them they had to add something to make sure they were right with God. Isaiah 64, 6, the prophet says this, We are all infected and impure with sin. When we display our righteous deeds, they are nothing but filthy rags. Let that sink in. On our best day, we are good for nothing when it comes to our own good merits and our own good deeds. So if we had to do all the best, if we were the best person in the world, and we came before God and said, hey, look, I was such a good person. He's like, yeah, that was filthy rags. That, I'm sorry, it's filthy rags. It doesn't cut it. So we can't get to God on our own. That's why Jesus came to us. Secondly, we're all responsible for our own faith journey, and we must pray and seek the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Galatians 1, 15 and 16, Paul said, Even before I was born, God chose me and called me by his marvelous grace. Then it pleased him to reveal his son to me so that I would proclaim the good news about Jesus to the Gentiles. When this happened, I did not rush to consult with human beings. So again, there he's saying, I'm not looking for human approval or authority. I'm trusting in Christ. It was his own journey with God. But secondly, other translations will say that it pleased I'm getting ahead of myself. But we're responsible for our own faith journey, and we must seek the leadership of the Holy Spirit. So that's what Paul was doing. Okay? He didn't go out and rush to the apostles. He met them three years later. He was seeking to be obedient to the Holy Spirit in his life. And so we must do the same. Now, two things to note here. This doesn't mean that we shouldn't li listen to biblical preaching or teaching or seek godly counsel. Because scripture does say we should seek godly counsel. But we are responsible for our own journey in our relationship with the Lord. So sometimes the Lord will lead us to others who can pray with us, for us, can encourage us, help us in our walk with God. So we need that. But remember, first and foremost, I'm not responsible for your faith journey. Your neighbor is not responsible for your faith journey. Your spouse is not. Your parents are not. You alone are responsible for your relationship with God. And not all of us are chosen by God to have ministries like Paul, but God has chosen for every single person to come to Christ to be transformed like Paul. So you may not have the ministry of Paul. God has not maybe chosen you to be a Paul to this generation, but he has chosen that he would transform you just like he did Paul. It's pretty amazing because the, the transformation that happened in the life of Paul is phenomenal. This leads me to my next point. The gospel or good news is not just to get out of hell free pass, but it's a whole life change. Scott McKnight says this, the gospel doesn't work for spectators. You have to participate for it to work its powers. What this means is that the gospel is the whole life story or, or the whole life Jesus story is a whole life of Jesus story. In other words, you can't just come to church go home, and then come back the next Sunday. You can't just say that you're a Christian and not live it out. You can't just spectate. You can't just sit on your hands. If your faith is real, it has to be active. It has to be alive. And it has to be a part of your whole entire being. The life of Jesus should be so intertwined with your life that when people see you, they see Jesus. And that's what he's trying to say here. Paul didn't stop trying to kill and arrest Christians and become one himself. He didn't quietly accept Jesus and continue with his life. No, he was transformed from the inside out. People went from being scared to death of Paul, then celebrating the transformation and the ministry and the preaching that this man had. So he went from being a persecutor 
to persecute Id. And no one does that in their right mind unless there was something intervening in their heart and life. And the Holy Spirit did just that. As Paul wrote to the Corinthian church, he said, anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old is gone, the new life has begun. And that's how we know that if we're truly obedient to Christ, is our life new? Have we changed? Is there a visible mark of change in our life? It doesn't have to be a dramatic change, but there still should be change, and there should be evidence for it. Lastly, like Paul, Christ wants to make his life known through you. Paul was chosen by God to show his own power, his own transformative work in this man. And he wants to do the same in you. He wants to make his life known through you. That's amazing. In scripture, we're called ambassadors. Ambassadors are people that have diplomatic powers, right? So if they go on behalf of the United States, they are basically the voice of the United States in that area. And Christ has called us to be his ambassadors. So you have a voice. But your voice should line up with that of the Holy Spirit and that of the word of God. Our life should line up with his. But he has called us to be his ambassadors, to be his children. He has chosen. But we have to respond. So human effort, achievements, faithfulness, merits, our own works can't make us right with God. We are all responsible for our own faith journey, and we must pray and seek the leadership of the Holy Spirit. The gospel or the good news is not just a get out of hell free card or a pass, but it's a whole life change. And like Paul, Christ wants to make his life known through you. So this morning, as we continue in worship, we're going to have a time of reflection. And this time, I don't want it to be just a time where we take a look at our hearts and confess sins that we have or pause. Maybe there's a next step for you. Paul's next step was to get baptized. So he was blinded for three days. He got up, was baptized, and he started going to preach. I don't know about you. Maybe, maybe God's calling you to do ministry somewhere. Maybe it's not anything crazy. Maybe it's just saying, you know what? He wants you to go and talk to your coworker. Maybe he wants you to share something with your friend in school. Maybe he wants you to go somewhere to go share the gospel with people that don't have access like we do. Maybe he's calling you to be more active in the church. I don't know, and I'm not trying to tell you what to do, but only you and God know. But we are all called to live out our faith. So I don't know what your next step is this morning. But maybe in this time of reflection, one, we can use this as a time to focus our hearts and minds on Jesus, the one who brings transformation through his life-giving grace. But maybe you have another, a next step that you need to take. And maybe this morning, you could pray about that. But before we take communion, Paul encouraged the believers in Corinth to examine themselves, to take a look at their heart and their minds. So when they came to take of the bread and the cup, that they were right with God. That they did all they could just to make sure that they were focusing on him and not making it about them or just going through the motions. He also said to call for if there was need of healing, to seek prayer. If you had sin weighing you down, to confess that. You can confess that to him. You don't have to confess it to me. You don't need a priest. You don't need a pastor. You can talk to him on your own. Again, this is your own faith journey. But the altar is open. If you would like someone to pray with you, the altar is open. If you want someone to come to you, raise your hand. I would be more than happy to. And there's a couple other leaders that would love to come and pray with you. But we're going to turn the lights down. I'm going to ask everybody to have their head bowed, eyes closed. We're just going to have a time of reflection just to examine ourselves, just to confess, to reflect, and to focus on our Lord.
So, Father God, as we come to you, we just thank you for your love and your grace that was revealed in Christ Jesus. Jesus, we thank you for your willingness to go and to bear our sins on the cross, to die in our place. We thank you that you are now (laughs) seated at the right hand of your Father, ruling and reigning, the one that stands in between us and your Father, the one who doesn't look at us guilty, but has given us new life and forgiveness because of your sacrifice. So as we remember that truth and that reality this morning, we just thank you for your body that was broken and your blood that was shed. We thank you for the bread that represents that body that was broken on our behalf and that blood that was shed for our cleansing. So as we come this morning, may our hearts and minds be excited and hopeful because you have risen and you are coming again. And that you have broken the power of death and sin and hell in our lives. So we love you, and as we continue in worship, may you be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward. And as they come, and as you all come, I invite all believers, all who have placed their faith and trust in Christ, to come to the Lord's table this morning and come with a receptive posture. So if you would hold your hands open to receive the communion this morning. They will offer you the elements saying, this is the body of Christ broken for you and the blood of Christ shed for you. I ask, and and I ask you to risk believing that when they say that, you, you truly believe that this was, this is a representation or a picture of Jesus giving himself for you. And receive that gift with gratitude and love and hope and joy. But as you come, I invite you to stand, to exit the outside of your rows, return back to the middle aisle. And just to come in a posture of worship and reverence, but also in celebration and joy.
So as they left from the upper room, the apostles left singing a hymn, and uh, we just invite you to sing as we continue to celebrate the goodness of our Father. And I hope we have a hymn. in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, begotten from the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of the same essence as the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. He became incarnate by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and he became flesh. He was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. On the third day, he rose again, according to the scriptures. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right Father's, hand, Father's right hand. He will come again with glory to judge the living and the dead. His kingdom will never end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life. He proceeds from the Father and the Son, and with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified. He spoke through the prophets. We believe in one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. We believe in one holy universal church. We look forward to the resurrection of the dead and to life in the world to come. Amen. Okay, so before we leave this morning, I have an exciting announcement. So I'm going to ask the uh, Jones family, if you guys will come up here, please. 
So I have Jennifer and Michael and Kate coming forward, and they have decided to take the next step, and they would like to join the church. So I've had the pleasure to get to know this family, and they are an incredible family, and I'm so glad to have them as, as part of our church. So I'm going to ask you all, uh, you all have trusted in Christ, and you have been baptized in accordance with Scripture. Yeah. yeah. Okay, as members of Grace Church, will you vow to faithfully participate in the church's ministries by your prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness? Yes. In church, as they seek to be a part of the church's ministries, will you support with your prayers, your presence, gifts, service, and witness in their life as well? Okay, so it's my pleasure to say welcome to the, the family here at Grace. So, Love you guys, thankful for you. And so uh, if you guys just wanna show them your love and your appreciation that they are a part of our family. So thank you guys so much. We're gonna, I'm gonna pray for them real quick. And then, uh, yes, yes ma'am. Oh, I, my goodness, I didn't realize that. Well, happy birthday. So if you wanna say happy birthday to her too, um, happy birthday and <laughs> so. We will uh, pray for them, and then we will get ready to dismiss. But Father God, I thank you for this family. I thank you for their witness and just their desire to come in and take the next step of faith. So I ask that as they have partnered with this church and have said we want to be part of this family, that we would support them as they are trying to walk with you. And as we are all trying to walk with you, may they support us too. So we just ask that you go before them and uh, just please remind them that you are with them every step of the way. We love you and we thank you for them. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, guys. So before we head out, I want to read one passage of scripture, and then uh, we'll be out of here. So remember, tonight we have students at 5. We've shifted time, so if you want to come to this Sunday night study, that will be at 6. We're going to continue in the basics of our faith. Um, but I want you, again, from what Paul said in Galatians 1, he said, May God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. Jesus gave his life for our sins, just as God our Father planned, in order to rescue us from the evil world in which we live. All glory to God the Father forever. Amen. So may you know the love of the Father, the grace of the Son, and the peace of the Holy Spirit. May that be with you. <laughs> Thank you.